Well, as I'm looking over behind me, Ron's over there. And so he thinks I'm looking at him, right? Well, I wanted to, I was really looking at the balls. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this ultra spooky, creeptastic, scary Halloween special King James episode of Fundy Fridays. If you're new around these parts, my wife, the Reverend Jen and I, here on this channel, we talk about things like fundamentalist Christianity, conservative politics, pop culture, gay stuff, and the way all those things just kind of bump into each other like half-melted Hershey bars at the bottom of the family salad bowl during Halloween. And today those candy bars are even more melted than usual. Because for this episode we're going to be taking a field trip down to the hot and sweaty state of Florida in all of its eccentric and humid glory. The last time you all came with me to Florida, we were checking in on Representative Matt Gates, and, well, at least all of the lunacy he had cooked up through September of 2022. And while he certainly had a couple of big wins to put on his resume as of late, he's still probably about as far away from the American presidency as just about any other American. But Gates aside, by all accounts, Florida has tapped into the dork side a little bit, summoning forth a very real and very evil contender for the upcoming 2024 election cycle. And it seems like the person the state has decided to send to the dance is none other than its monstrous right-wing extremist of a governor, Ron DeSantis. Now last year I said that I covered my Halloween special for that year, Ted Cruz, because he was the most requested person all the Genonites had reached out to me about. People were saying, oh, to cover Ted Cruz, talk about Ted Cruz. And I'm choosing Ron DeSantis this year for the same reason. He's the far and away most talked about person in all of my various inboxes, in, 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 inbox, I, whatever, uh, for 2023. I have heard no single political name more this entire year than that of Ron DeSantis. And in all the conversations I've had about him, it really seems like nobody knows exactly how to feel about this guy. Well, okay, don't get me wrong. Everybody that I talk to who's reasonable and has a good understanding of politics knows that he's absolutely terrible. Everyone seems to know that he sucks as a politician and, honestly, it seems like kind of as a person too. And he's definitely a political figure to be afraid of in that regard. DeSantis is unabashedly and antagonistically conservative, more than happy to strip rights away from any vulnerable population he can find, and would likely plunge this country even further into a Reagan-esque oligarchic hellscape devoid of love, joy, and happiness than it already is if he were to get within spitting distance of the White House. But what the folks I've talked to don't seem to fully grasp is exactly how afraid of that prospect they should be. And honestly, up until I did the research for this video, I would have considered myself of that mentality as well. Up until recently, DeSantis' name, it seems like, at least was everywhere. He was the terrifying new face of the GOP, right? He's been said to be just as violently regressive and playfully cruel as Trump, but without all of the baggage that would make it hard for him to get elected. And I don't know about y'all, but that is about as scary as a political prospect as I can possibly think of. And yet, recent reports indicate that this evil executive of the Everglades might not be all he's cracked up to be. His presidential campaign is currently faltering as new terrible forces rise from the void to seize the destiny that was once promised to him. And at this point, no one knows if he's gonna survive. So I guess the question for today is, is Ron DeSantis a real threat to claim the American presidency in 2024, thereby allowing him to terrorize the nation's dreams and nightmares for the next four years minimum? Or is he just a demented copycat who missed his shot and is now doomed to a cursed existence where his name is only uttered in whispers of what might have been? In other words, we're going to try and solve the biggest mystery in American politics today. Should you be afraid of a Ron DeSantis presidency? And just like always, in order to answer that, we're going to dig deep into his life, his career, his proclivities, and anything else we can find. But before jumping into something as unholy as Ron to Satan himself, we need to make sure that we're protected with the power of the Lord. And in order to do that, I decided to go out and get us a sponsor for today's episode straight from the Bible itself. And with that in mind, let's hear a word from today's sponsor, Adam and Eve. 
We would like to take a moment and thank the sponsor for today's episode, AdamandEve.com. The adults among our audience can go to AdamandEve.com right now and use code FUNDY to save 50% off one item plus free shipping in the US and Canada and free rush processing, although certain exclusions do apply. The most trusted name in adult fun, Adam and Eve has been in business for over 50 years. That's even older than me and I'm a vampire. They offer 24-7 customer support if you're a night person the way that I am. And discreet shipping for those of us who like a little extra privacy. So if you're an adult just Dying for an exciting new sensation? Uh, uh, uh. Visit Adam and Eve and use code FUNDY to get 50% off one item and to let them know that we sent you. And now, back to the show. So just like any good evaluation of a potential horror icon, we're going to start the process by taking a trip back in time to examine Ron's earliest days in the mortal realm. If we've learned anything from Jason Voorhees and Michael Myers, it's that to understand the monster, you have to understand first where it came from. So with that in mind, Ronald Dion DeSantis was born in Jacksonville, Florida on September 14th of 1978. While Ron himself may have been born under the shadow of palm trees and plastic castles, his roots actually run a more northern direction up into the Rust Belt. All eight of his great-grandparents were immigrants born in Italy who immigrated to the U.S. in the early 1900s to settle across Pennsylvania and Ohio. Ron is a devout, lifelong Roman Catholic, or at least that's what he says he is. As you might expect, I, I consumed a lot of Ron DeSantis media over the past couple of weeks as I was preparing for this episode, and... I couldn't once find any statement of religion that came even close to something I would call devout or honestly earnest. The only time Ron DeSantis talks about his religion is when he's using it to push some sort of political agenda. And you can kind of see a little bit of that in this next clip, which is a pretty good representation of all of the times I saw Ron talking about his religion. You consider yourself Roman Catholic today, still? Yeah. Okay, sounds good. Uh, tell me a little bit about, do you have a, like a favorite Bible verse or is there something that kind of... I would say I'm the way, the truth, and the life from the, from the book of John. I mean, I think that, you know, there's a lot of great stuff um, that you can point, a lot of inspiring uh, passages, but, you know, do you, is that where you're at, you know, as an individual and, and with your heart? And if you're there, then I think that's really uh, the, the number one threshold uh, that, that you got to cross. And so that's where we are. Stay with me. You and your wife recently had twins, okay? How does it feel to be a new dad? You know, we wanted to stay as a team, execute, give 100%. Play by play. Ron's parents met while attending Youngstown State University in Ohio, go Penguins, before heading off for the sunny shores of Jacksonville, Florida. They'd move around the state a bit before expanding their family with Ron and his sister and settling down in the Tampa suburb of Dunedin. His mother would make her living as a nurse and his father as a Nielsen cable ratings box installer, meaning that Ron's background is distinctly working class. And while that may make him seem trustworthy, don't be fooled. For as we shall see, this is merely the mask that hides his true, terrible face. Now, Ronnie D would actually first make his name in Dunedin as a baseball player. One could even say that baseball was the first place where Ron got a taste of the national spotlight when he and his Dunedin national team qualified for the 1991 Little League World Series. And baseball would open more doors for Ron. Ron would continue his baseball career at Yale University, where he would spend four years as an outfielder. Just like fellow Republican George H.W. Bush, actually, who played first base for this same Yale Bulldogs baseball team in the 1940s. Ron would end his baseball career with just three total errors and a very respectable lifetime batting average of 336, which is actually one of the only respectable things about him. He even managed to get his own baseball card, which is objectively just one of the coolest things any human being can do. Or... Okay, at least it would have been cool if he didn't print the exact same card later as a hackneyed campaign prop, which definitely cheapens the overall experience. Oh, and that's not to mention that nowadays Ron just uses baseball as a way to be weirdly racist and awful towards other sports. 
Ted Williams, when he got inducted to the Hall of Fame, said baseball gives every American uh, boy a chance to succeed. Mm -hmm. And I think there's something to that. There's so many different places that you need to have on a baseball team and there's different skills that are required. So some people can be a pitcher, some people can be a middle infielder, some people can be a catcher. And so I think that there's kind of a place for everybody on a baseball team if you're willing to work hard, if you're willing to practice, and if you're willing to, to hone your skills. So I, I, I kind of thought it was always a very democratic game, a very merit, meritocratic game. Whereas mm -hmm. I kind of viewed like, like basketball as like, these guys are just freaks of nature. They're just like <laughs> did incredible athletes. Sure thing, Ron. I'm sure you can also tell us all why John Stockton is the GOAT and not Jordan, y you know, because of the passing, right? But I have to be honest, Ron wasn't even just a star athlete at Yale University. In fact, he kind of seemed to have made a habit in that time of his life of overachieving at every possible turn. This comes to us from a 2001 write-up he received in the St. Petersburg Times from reporter Nancy Morgan as a graduating athlete. The history and political science graduate earned a 3.75 GPA and captained the baseball team his senior year. DeSantis was named to the 2001 Verizon Academic All-District University team and received honorable mention on the All-Ivy squad. Some of our students struggle when they first come to Yale, said John Stuper, the Ivy League school's baseball coach. When Ron came here, his academic credentials were beyond reproach. Since his freshman year, DeSantis has made A or A- grades. A top 10% finish in his graduating class convinced DeSantis that his dedication and study skills paid off. When he was elected by his teammates as captain of the Bulldogs' final season, the outfielder heartily accepted the honor and was praised by Stuper for his efforts. That same baseball coach, by the way, who actually only retired in 2022 and is currently a devoted supporter of Ron, he can give us a little bit more insight into exactly how Ron's working class background translated to the world of Ivy League athletics. You stayed in touch even after he left Yale. You say that he is the furthest thing from privileged. You say he was never born with a silver spoon in his mouth. He, he was a hard worker. He worked more jobs at Yale. I don't know honestly how um, we get athletes for 20 hours a week in the season. Um, and he was working jobs to defray the cost of tuition to help his parents. I mean, everything from setting up for football games to being a ball chaser at soccer games to anything he could do, um, you know, to make a little extra money. Um, so he was, he's blue collar. He's absolutely blue collar. Okay, also, uh, while I'm here, I. I stared at this tattoo for like 10 minutes. Um, does this man have a kitchen wizard tattoo of a sandwich on his forearm? Please let me know if I'm crazy and seeing things, because all I can see is an amateur tattoo of a sandwich. So yeah, you can say a lot of terrible things about Ron DeSantis, and Lord knows I'm going to here today, but one thing you do have to admit is that he worked hard to put himself through school. Between the baseball scholarship, the side jobs, and that GPA of his, his work ethic and blue-collar roots did shine through in his college tenure. It almost makes you think there's no way he could be that horrible monster everyone talks about, right? Well, think again! See, Ronnie wasn't just the all-American son of two working stiffs trying to use his skills on the baseball diamond to make it in the world of old money academia. He also clearly had an interest in using this time at Yale to start building connections with the influential upper crust of American society. He would start that process off by joining the Delta Kappa Epsilon fraternity, one of the oldest in the U.S. and actually founded at Yale first in 1844. Now this is an organization whose alumni includes five former presidents and four former vice presidents while still having like half their Wikipedia dedicated to a section detailing all of their various controversies for hazing and racism. Ron would also become a member of the St. Elmo Society, part of Yale's quote-unquote ancient eight consortium of secret societies that date back to the mid-19th century. The most famous of these secret organizations is likely the Skull and Bones Society, since it's the only one that has gotten a movie so far as I know, and also because they literally had a hand in both sides of the 2004 presidential race. While we don't know a lot about these secret societies, one thing we as the public do know is that they all have just an absurd number of highly influential Americans that they count among their alumni. 
St. Elmo's Society itself, for example, boasts among its ranks everyone from former Attorney General John Ashcroft to Get Out actress Allison Williams to the literal actual J.P. Morgan of J.P. Morgan Chase, the literal actual largest bank on Earth. Also, did not know until making this episode what J.P. Morgan looked like, and damn, dude looks like he's out here trying to bust the Keebler Elves Union. Now, this combination of highly respected membership and clandestine activity has made all of these secret societies at Yale just a lightning rod for conspiracy theories for decades now. You can trace a surprising number of Illuminati rumors back to them specifically, and please don't ask me about the coffin ritual because it's just gross and I don't want to talk about it. Truthfully, a lot of what's attributed to them is probably sensationalized, but all the same, it's weird for all of these American elite to take these black-robed secret detours in college, right? It just feels like that Eyes Wide Shut, Hellfire Club, weird rich people stuff we all highly suspect that they do, but can't ever actually confirm. I think we can all agree, too, that it's likely not a place where you're going to find friends of the American laborer, if you know what I mean. And personally, I think joining organizations like these gives us a little bit of insight into Ron's worldview even back then and especially given the political monster he'll end up turning into later. Ron may not have been born with that silver spoon in his mouth, but he was determined to acquire one and just jam it in there on his own. Also, hey, side note, but please let me know in the comments if you'd be interested in an episode on collegiate secret societies or something like that. They became a bit of an obsession of mine while writing this, and I swear, even just the stuff we know about these things is crazy. But anyway, after a jam-packed collegiate experience filled with home runs, hard work, and highly secretive rituals, which may or may not involve whacking it in a coffin, Ron did end up graduating from Yale in 2001 with a Bachelor's of History, which will take us to the next part of our story. Following his graduation, Ron would spend a year teaching and coaching high school sports at the prestigious Darlington School Private Academy in Rome, Georgia. Now, astute civics nerds like me who've been following him for a little bit may have noticed that Ron never really talks about this period in his life and often even leaves it out of his official political bios. And turns out there's probably a pretty good reason for that. A rather shocking 2022 expose from Francis Robles at the New York Times revealed Ron to be a rather, let's say, controversial figure at the school. Now, to be fair, some former students recalled Ron being very intelligent and having a special ability connecting with some students. And in my reading, it seemed like the boys he coached in football and baseball really liked him in particular. And that's the end of the good stuff he did there. So what about the bad stuff? Well, per his former student, Ron acted like a smug jerk that had trouble separating himself and his ego from the student population, targeted a black student with harassment in his history class, spent significant amounts of classroom time explaining to his students that the Civil War wasn't about slavery, it was just a disagreement about economic plans. And he apparently did that enough for it to become an inside joke referenced in their senior recap video that year. Ron also used significant amounts of class time discussing his pro-life views with students and goaded another student into attempting the Gallon Challenge, during which the student threw up several times while Ron laughed at him. And perhaps most concerningly, several individuals in the article referenced Ron as a common sight at student parties where alcohol was available. This included a now rather infamous photograph of him attending one of said parties, reportedly with students who were drinking. Now, Robles did not name any of the women in the photograph, but she did report getting in touch with each one of them. All of them apparently expressed that people at the party were drinking, but they also report that they and everyone else in attendance were graduated seniors over 18 at the time. Which, I mean, okay, yeah, it makes it legal, I guess, but it doesn't really remove the inherent ickiness of Ron's student-teacher party time situation. But, I mean, you know, I'm sure, like, at least they hired a bouncer guy or something to check all the IDs at the door, so we can be sure that no minors got in, right? Students even reported that the year after Ron left, they saw on all the teachers' desks a memo reminding them not to fraternize with students, and that most of them kind of assumed this had something to do with old 
Coach DeSantis. And I guess it makes sense why he only lasted a year. When you're so gross that admin starts off the year by sending out a memo to all the other teachers telling them not to act like you in particular, well, it's it's about time to skedaddle from that job, isn't it? Also, libertarians, please remind me again how bad public school is for my kid when this is the free market alternative. But also, Ron had other things to attend to, including a stop that every political supervillain wannabe makes after undergrad. Law school. For this academic endeavor, Ron would actually step away from Yale and instead take himself to Harvard Law School. The law school's so good that it's probably the one you think of when someone says the phrase law school. You got into Harvard Law? What, like it's hard? But even that wasn't apparently challenging, imperialistic, or republican enough for Ron. And so, while in the middle of his second year of law school in 2004, Ron enlisted with the U.S. Navy. He would immediately from there be commissioned as a junior lieutenant, sent to the Naval Justice School in Newport, Rhode Island, and assigned to the Judge Advocate General's Corps, better known as the JAG Corps. Now, if you're anything like me, you thought JAG was just some weird army show your grandparents watched after dinner while the meatloaf was digesting in their stomachs. But it turns out the JAG Corps is actually, like, a really big deal. It's basically the Navy's legal team. They handle all things law for America's floating firepower there. Also, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna stop for a second. Can you all, can we talk for a second? Like, there are people out here in this world right now who are lawyers. They're lawyers. They've been to law school, graduated law school, got a Juris Doctorate, and they're also simultaneously in the Navy. Okay? I, I, King James, I have a hard time motivating myself to go out and check the mail sometimes. And there are really people out here right now being lawyers and in the Navy at the same time. What, like it's hard? But anyway, following his graduation from the NJS in 2005, Ron would be assigned to the naval station Mayport in his hometown of Jacksonville, Florida, before in 2006 being assigned to, and I couldn't make this up if I wanted to, Guantanamo Bay. It's honestly a development in this story so cartoonishly evil that I wish it weren't true because it sounds unrealistic. Okay, well, I also wish it weren't true because of all the war crimes and such, but you know what I mean. And speaking of war crimes, per at least two reports from former Guantanamo detainees, Ron attended some number of force feeding sessions inflicted upon hunger strikers in the period from 2005 to 2006. Mansar Ahmad Saad al Dafi and Ahmed Uld Abdel Aziz were released after a decade each of incarceration, neither having ever been charged with a crime or accused of any formal wrongdoing. Now, as you might expect, Ron has denied the assertions that he sat in on force-feeding sessions. And in fact, it's one of these denials that has become the sassy little Ron DeSantis meme of the day. During your uh, time at Guantanamo, did you witness any incidents? No, no, not all that's BS. No, totally, totally BS. Yeah. Did you say you were present during yep. Yep. force feedings? Is, is that, is that, Who uh, said that? How would they know me? Okay, think about that. Do you honestly believe that's credible? So this is 20, 2006. I'm a junior officer. Do you honestly think that they would have remembered me from Adam? Of course not. They're just trying to get into the news because they know people like you will consume it because it fits your preordained narrative. Until the point okay, that then, I'm not done okay. talking yet. You will speak when I'm done. Oh, Ooh, honey. Girl, okay. security. Now, Per the office he worked for, Ron's stated mission was, and I'm going to read this straight off of my notes, to conduct safe and humane care and custody of detained enemy combatants in support of the global war on terrorism. But I mean literally, the Bush administration went way out of their way to classify Guantanamo detainees as unlawful combatants instead of prisoners of war just to make sure the Geneva Convention didn't apply to them. So I think we can assume that their official line on anything is worthless. Likewise, we maybe could check his military record, except for the fact that the Navy redacted the ever-loving shit out of it, ensuring only the vaguest version of Ron's time at Gitmo is available for public confirmation. Sorry y'all, but I'm forced to invoke Cardi B on this one. That's suspicious. That's weird. But honestly, I think we can take Ron's word for it by just listening to the amount of venom with which he speaks about those whose rights he was tasked to guard there. This from a 2018 interview Ron conducted with Florida reporter Jim Lafide. 
What was your experience there and what exactly did you do while you were there? When I decided to commission uh, as a JAG officer in the U.S. Navy, I volunteered to serve in Gitmo. I was uh, sent down there on temporary assignments working for the Joint Task Force Guantanamo, which was in charge of dealing with these terrorists that were there. So um, were you interviewing terrorists? Were you, were, you, were you a legal advisor? I was a legal advisor. For those um, that were doing... The things that would happen is the thing you notice the day you get down there is for these detainees, the jihad was still ongoing, right. and they would wage jihad any way they can. Now, they're in a facility, so it's limited, but some of the things they would do, they would do hunger strikes, and you actually had three detainees that committed suicide with hunger strikes. So everything at that time was legal in nature one way or another. So the commander wants to know, well, how do I combat this? So one of the jobs of the legal advisor would be like, hey, you actually can force feed. Here's what you can do. Here's kind of the rules of that. You also had a lot of detainees claiming abuse because this was in the wake of Abu Ghraib. And that was used offensively against our guards. So our guards would have feces thrown at them, all this other stuff. And yet they would be charged with detainee abuse. So we had to evaluate all that. So what I learned from that and I took to Iraq when I was working with SEAL Team 1 is they are using things like detainee abuse offensively against us. It was a tactic, technique, and procedure. So yeah, call me crazy, but that doesn't sound like someone who's interested at all in defending human rights, the due process of law, or the integrity of the U.S. Navy. And I can't make any conclusive claims about this, but to me at least, it sure sounded like somebody who would definitely attend force feedings for recreation. Okay, I just want to take a moment to highlight, this man literally spent a year terrorizing high school students and attending their parties like some sort of weird man-child before screwing off and saying, nah, let me go participate in some war crimes instead. Like, okay, God, I know I'm supposed to be sticking with this whole monster metaphor thing, but like, this is just James talking. Oh my God, Ron DeSantis sucks. But at least according to the official version of things, whatever Ron was doing at Guantanamo actually warranted a promotion. And so in 2007, Ron was sent to Iraq to serve as a legal advisor for a SEAL team deployment in Fallujah. From there, he would be sent back to Florida in 2008 and bounce around a few more JAG assignments. And it's during that time where he would meet former reporter and PGA tour correspondent Casey Black. And he would meet her in the most Republican way I can possibly think of. Television news that brought Casey to the River City and a game of golf that landed her in Ron DeSantis' sights. We met at the University of North Florida at the driving range. Anyway, long story short, we start to talk and, and that's how we met. Ron and Casey would wed in 2009 at Disney World, which I'm pretty sure is a legal requirement for all Floridians, and as of today have had three children together. Honestly, Casey seems oddly decent and appealing given her abomination of a husband. She's a breast cancer survivor whose primary focus seems to be mental health awareness. But yeah, Ron is such a problem that he can even tarnish a reputation like that just by association. And getting back to Ron, he would end up retiring from active duty in 2010 and would later on retire from the Naval Reserve in 2019. He would end his service with several commendations and at the rank of lieutenant commander, which is kind of the midpoint between a first year lieutenant and a general. Ron would spend the year after his retirement from the military on a brief run operating an LSAT prep program, which if you're not familiar, the LSAT is basically just the SAT or the ACT for law school, and also spending a little bit of time as a trial lawyer before finally making his first formal move into American party politics in 2012. Following the 2010 election cycle, a Florida redistricting effort saw longtime GOP stalwart Cliff Stearns, representative from Florida's 6th Federal House District, suddenly redrawn into the new 3rd District. This left his extremely safe Republican seat up for grabs in the new version of the 6th District. And what I mean by that is that this is another one of those American districts that's basically so neon red that whoever won the GOP primary was all but guaranteed to take the general election too. For context, Starnes had represented the 6th since 1989, and the district is still in Republican control to this day, going on now for 34 straight years. Which is why it's no surprise that the primary was a bloodbath, with a whopping seven Republicans all vying for the party nod. Ron would end up winning a convincing victory over the rest of the field, taking around 39% of the total vote en route to the general election against a fellow former Navy veteran, Democrat Heather Bevan. Now I gotta say, in my opinion, it was a damn good thing for Lil Ron that this district was so GOP safe. 
I found some interview footage from this first run, and at least in my opinion, you can tell he is nervous. I mean, I'm going to talk over this part right here, and you all can even look and see how fidgety and twitchy he is. He's, he's definitely not comfortable in his seat right now. And his answers weren't much better. Take note of his answer to this upcoming question we're about to see, wherein I'm personally pretty sure the reporter incorrectly states that Ron took a donation from the Arizona Diamondbacks baseball team. Now, while it was reasonable to criticize Ron for taking a large amount of money from outside the district to fund his 2012 campaign, which he definitely did, I do earnestly think this was a mistake on the reporter's part. All I could find in my research was a $5,000 donation he took from Major League pitcher and former Yale teammate Craig Breslow, who at the time did pitch for the Diamondbacks. While I could be wrong about this, I'm assuming that the reporter just kind of read the sheet incorrectly because when you make a political donation, you are required to list your employer. This, in my opinion, should be an easy correction for Ron. He highlights the reporter's mistake, mentioned that the donation is actually small and from an individual, divert to a new topic. This, this should be easy, right? But not for Ron, who just kind of wants to run with it and talk about how the Diamondbacks love him so much as a dude and not just as a politician, man, before awkwardly licking his lips in the shadiest way imaginable. One of your lead uh, campaign donors, the Arizona Diamondbacks baseball team. Should this campaign be more local, though, from local donors? And what do you say to people who fear maybe he's just going to go to Washington, be another Republican, and just vote straight with the party? Well, uh, the Arizona Diamondbacks, I was the captain of the Yale baseball team. My successor is a major league pitcher. And at the time he was with the Arizona Diamondbacks, you know, those guys make a lot of money. And so I called him up, said, hey, can you help me? He doesn't really care about politics. It's not that he just wanted to help me because he believed in me as a person and got some of his teammates to help as well. So but will you be an independent? But since this was a district where Democrats go to die, Ron would even still claim an easy 15 point victory over the challenger Bevan and take the seat outright. He would win re-election for this seat in 2014 by an even wider margin of 25 points, and in 2016 he even had time to briefly run for U.S. Senate, let Marco Rubio change his mind and run for it instead, drop out of that race and go back to the House race, and still beat the Democrat by 16 points. Ron's three terms representing the Florida Sixth are, as you might imagine, a tale of following the Republican Party line to the letter. If the Republicans believed in something, then Ron absolutely believed in it, and by Jesus and Mary, he was going to believe in it harder than anybody else. One can see this in the stances he would take, like taking time to sign a pledge stating he would never support a climate tax in his very first year in office. One can also see this in his dueling special interest scorecards, a rousing A-plus from the NRA and a flat zero from the LGBTQIA-focused Human Rights Coalition. One could also see this in the legislation Ron introduced, which included the Let Seniors Work Act, which sought to both remove Social Security incentives towards retirement and to remove certain payroll taxes from senior employees with the goal of ensuring as many elderly individuals are encouraged to go back to work as possible. I mean, hey, I've heard him say that the children yearn for the mind, so maybe the old men yearn to take away upward mobility from younger generations? Fired our friends, we hired old men. We made a conscious choice to get rid of the young and bring in the old. But perhaps most impactfully, Ron was a founding member of the House Freedom Caucus, a subgroup of House GOP members whose primary characteristic is, at least according to the Pew Research Center, being more conservative than most Republicans. Now, I personally find this important for two reasons. Number one, the Freedom Caucus is still huge and very influential in the House making strides every single day in pulling America farther and farther onto the right wing. This is a testament to Ron's skills as a politician, bridging the gap between acceptable, albeit heinous, conservative ideology and full-speed Trumpist nonsense. And speaking of the orange devil himself, this leads me to my second point as to why I consider Ron's work on the Freedom Caucus so important. Keen-eyed Genonites may notice that Ron's tenure in the House overlaps with a certain apocalyptic 2016 American election cycle, which ushered Donald Trump into the Oval Office on the back of a wave of faux populist conservative rage. 
And Ron was the perfect kind of candidate for just such a moment in American history. He carried all the academic credentials and political clout one might expect from a candidate for a very high public office, while also dragging along with him the brash, conservative hyper-masculinity that was just so trendy at the time. Think about it, Ivy educated, Navy lawyer, successful representative, and a leader of the House's far-right fringe contingent? This is starting to remind me more and more of last year when we covered Ted Cruz. I mean, hell, the legal expertise and political aptitude demonstrated by people like this are usually enough to ingratiate oneself with big money donors and cruise into office just on their support alone. And hell, Ted Cruz didn't even have the military background that Ron has. But beyond even all that, Ron possessed just the unique blend of creepy overtones, braggadocious conservative zeal, and a callous approach to public policy that had just become so popular among the Republican rabble in a post-Trump world. Ron was effectively seen as the kind of candidate who could bridge the gap between big money conservative donors and everyday Trump voters. And in today's GOP, there's probably not more valuable skill than that one. And what's more, it's pretty obvious that Ron knew during his time in the House that he was primed for a big leap forward in his political profile. Seizing the momentum as former Republican Governor Rick Scott headed to the Senate after being termed out, Ron would dive headfirst into the Florida gubernatorial race of 2018. Ron worked to present himself to Florida's GOP voter base as their own personal little state Trump that would just jump right in and make Florida great again. At that point in his career, Ron really wanted people to conflate him with Trump as much as they possibly could. When asked to pick even a single issue with which he disagreed with Trump at the time, Ron declined to do so, essentially indicating his full unwavering support for all of Trump's policies and opinions. And it didn't stop there. Ron would film a campaign ad featuring his own children learning such wonderful things as how to spell MAGA and how to literally build a wall. And yeah, this screenshot, it's all you're getting. I'm not even going to humor this nonsense by showing it here. Plus, the DeSantis kids didn't consent to being used as just the worst political props ever, so let's spare them having to be associated with this any more than they already are. Because what's important is that apparently Trump noticed this gesture and appreciated it, paying it off to Ron in a big way with a huge endorsement leading right into the primary. Earlier today, I also spent time with your current governor, one of our nation's truly great leaders, Rick Scott. But I wanted to be here to formally endorse Ron. You got to get out and vote. Get your friends, get your colleagues, get your neighbors and get out and vote in November. And if this list of endorsements for both Ron and Adam Putnam, his lead opponent in that GOP primary, doesn't tell you everything you need to know about Ron's 2018 gubernatorial campaign, then I don't know if anything will. But see, in Florida 2018, apparently all one needed was one huge endorsement because Ron would claim victory over Putnam in the primary before heading on to the general election against former Tallahassee mayor and Democratic gubernatorial candidate Andrew Gillum. And y'all, I know I cover lots of different types of political races, but this was one for the ages. Ron and Andrew both came into the race from similar positions within their respective parties, rising stars who also happened to carry around just as much baggage as they did potential. Both parties pushed tons of resources into this race, and the endorsement list for each candidate might as well have been a birthday card for Beyonce with how everybody signed it. This election was seen as THE competitive toss-up of the 2018 cycle, and polls were going every which direction, leading right up into the race itself. Now, Ron certainly tried to hand the entire thing over to Gillum, committing the biggest and most memorable gaffe of the race during a Fox News interview just one day after his primary victory. And warning for this next clip, extreme racism. You know, I watched those Democrat debates. None of that was, was my cup of tea. But, I mean, he performed better than the other people there. So, so we've got to work hard to make sure that we continue Florida going in a good direction. Let's build off the success we've had on Governor Scott. The last thing we need to do is to monkey this up by trying to embrace a socialist agenda. Oh, my God! Oh, and you best believe Andrew seized on that one with gusto in the debates. 
forewarning in this next clip, I'm uh, going to let you listen to what Andrew has to say, but I want you to keep an eye on Ron here as he does a spot-on impression of a young child who just got caught with a pocket full of stolen pixie sticks and knows they're in trouble. The, the congressman let us know exactly uh, where he was going to take this race the day after he won the nomination. The monkey up comment said it all, and he has only continued in the course of his campaign to draw all the attention he can uh, to the color of my skin. And the truth is, as you know what, I'm black. I've been black all my life. So far as I know, I will die black. <laughs> Uh, but this is the point. The, the, the only color that the people of the state of Florida care about is the blue-green algae flowing out of the east and the west side of this state. And yet, because far too many American voters are unreasonably forgiving towards blatant racism, Ron was able to survive this awful blunder and claim victory over Gillum. The contest ended up becoming a hotly contested, machine-recounted slobber knocker that went right down to the wire and well within the margin of error. 0.4% of the total overall vote determined the outcome of this race. Gillum initially conceded, and then when he figured out it was so narrow, he retracted that concession before giving the concession back eventually once he lost the machine recount and paving the way for the DeSantis era to take hold in Florida. So as most of you probably either know or at least suspect by now, Ron's uh, first term as governor was bad. And by bad, I mean bad, bad. Forewarning, I'm not going over his policy actions line by line like I've done with some of my other subjects, because quite frankly, it is just depressing as all hell what this man has done to the beautiful state of Florida. But I have read extensive coverage of Ron's tenure and policies, and I can tell you that, generally speaking, you can just assume that if there is an extreme conservative way to solve a problem, that's the way Ron's gonna try and do it. All right, so giving the devil his due here, Ron did actually beef up Florida's environmental regulations, in some capacity at least, including putting in place measures to combat the state's algae problem. To take away some of that do, though, he still won't say that humans have had any effect on climate change, and he also signed a bill that made it illegal for any Florida local government to ban any kind of electrical power generation, no matter how bad that method may be for the environment. But yes, what I told you is Ron's most moderate political position, and honestly, about as good overall as it's gonna get with him. Now, it's important to remember that in 2018, the GOP was still happily fantasizing about Trump's second term in 2020. At the time back in 2018, Ron would have only just turned 40 years old. If things fell the right way for him, he would be in position to swoop in right behind Trump in 2024 and claim the presidency for the Republicans for another four years beyond the MAGA era. So it makes sense that Ron's primary goal, it seems like, as the governor of Florida was to establish himself as a potential presidential candidate later on down the road. Now, the governorship of the state of Florida has been in Republican hands since 1999, so the state and its policies are already plenty Republican as it is. But for an ethically challenged go-getter like Ron, there's still plenty of room in a situation like that to make a name for yourself. And in particular, Ron seemed to use this term to hone in on a few key pet issues that would help lay the groundwork for his future presidential pitch to the nation at large. For example, Ron barely waited to take his hand off the Bible from his swearing-in ceremony before getting to work putting his agenda in place. He appointed his first Florida Supreme Court Justice on January 9th of 2019, just one day after his swear-in. And later that same month, he would issue an executive order to ban all Common Core curriculum standards from the entire educational system of Florida. Essentially, this unilateral decision by Ron excused the entire state from national education standards. Under the guise of, uh, you know how they are, returning control to the parents or the local level or whatever it may be, you know why he did it. Now, of course, Common Core has been one of the central Republican boogeymen going on the past decade or so now, so this wasn't too terribly surprising of a move. But I think it's interesting as the first action in something that would become a much larger pet cause for Ron down the road. The de of the Florida education system. Yes, in a state with a smorgasbord of real problems to choose from, Ron spent much of his first term battling wokeness. 
Really, it's just the way Republicans conceptualize caring too much about vulnerable people in the state of the world, but I digress. Now, two of Ron's most prominent, effectual, and awful pieces of flagship legislation came from this focus on de-wokeified education. In June of 2021, Ron signed the Fairness in Women's Sports Act, banning transgender girls from school sports where to this day they are unjustly barred from participation with their peers in the state of Florida. Ron would also keep the ball rolling by taking charge of a Florida State Board of Education vote to ban critical race theory from all Florida K-12 institutions. Now, as one might expect, this move was widely panned by most Florida teachers and educational organizations, especially given the fact that Florida's public school curriculum didn't even teach CRT. And in fact, nobody who voted to remove it from the Florida public schools really seemed to be able to define it at all. All this really seemed to try and do was ban people from talking about how this nation was built by black slaves, which it absolutely 100% was. And so, of course, since this type of educational censorship is a terrible idea that most experts hate, Ron decided to pursue it even harder. In late December of 2021, Ron announced the introduction of the Stop Wrongs to Our Kids and Employees Act, or the Stop Woke Act for short. I'm really sorry I had to tell you about that. Remember, though, uh, when you're suppressing dry heaves, in through the nose, out through the mouth. That'll help settle your stomach, because, ugh, I know that's just awful. You know, we do have to, what Lakeisha said, is really focus on the foundations, on, on the basic pillars of what a good education is. And, and the court, certainly civics education uh, is a big part of that. Uh, but by us protecting against CRT and this Stop Woke Act, you know, we're going to be making sure that that time in school is actually spent learning and not just being targets of indoctrination. And that is going to be a very good thing for parents uh, throughout the state of Florida. So, all right, now obviously what we heard was just a bunch of DeSantis political gibberish. So let's go ahead and hear from Brooke Migden at The Hill to find out what this bill really does. The law, known as the Stop Woke Act, where woke is used as an acronym for wrongs to our kids and employees, was designed to combat woke indoctrination in Florida businesses and schools by prohibiting instruction that can make some parties feel they bear quote-unquote personal responsibility for historic wrongdoings because of their race, sex, or national origin. So yeah, I think we can all agree, this bill was pretty obviously designed to try and make sure that white Floridians never ever had to confront the fact that maybe sometimes white people in the past did some bad things. While tragically the law is still in effect for all K-12 schools in Florida, Judge Mark E. Walker of the Northern Florida District Court did at least block the bill's implementation in universities and businesses. And while I am sure that Judge Marky Mark Walker did that because it was obviously the right thing to do, I like to also believe he did it a little bit to punish him for that terrible bill name. Then, Ron would take one final shot at inflicting his conservative vision on his state's educational system with the Parental Rights in Education Act, more commonly known as the Don't Say Gay Bill. This bill was introduced in February 2022 with vocal support from Ron and passed the legislature en route to his desk for an enthusiastic signature by late March. Now, essentially, this bill laid forth the extremely vague definition that all Florida sex education had to be quote-unquote age appropriate, with basically no other real instruction as to what that term actually meant in the context of the bill. But what's more important is that this law also gave parents the right to sue schools and educators for violating its vague-ass terms. So now, every vindictive fundy in the state with an axe to grind, suddenly they can retaliate against, well, any school that violates their Christian sensibilities by literally just acknowledging the existence of gay and trans folks. Now, tragic spoiler alert, this bill did take effect in January of 2022, and by everything I could read is still in effect to this day. Let's all just take a moment and realize that Florida's school kids deserve much better than this, and that Ron should be absolutely ashamed of himself, although in that regard we can just kind of throw it onto the pile at this point. But this law did at least blow back on Ron in one major and satisfying way. See, Florida has a particularly strong relationship with a certain global entertainment mega-empire. 
and it turns out that this certain global entertainment mega empire both employs a lot of queer folks and has been recently trying to appeal itself to the LGBTQIA plus demographic and their sweet, sweet gay money. So when the Orlando Sentinel and journalist Scott Maxwell published an article highlighting how Disney had made donations to every single sponsor and co-sponsor listed on the bill, well, it went over about as well as a fart in line at Space Mountain. Disney CEO Bob Chapek tried to play it off and say that the company just wanted to make a more inclusive world with their content or something, but obviously this was met with near universal scorn. Many of Disney's most prominent writers, producers, and other staff voiced displeasure with the bill and the company in the media. Pixar and Marvel went rogue from the greater Disney corporate umbrella and issued their own statements denouncing the bill directly. Many employees walked out of Disney to protest their weak stance. Even freaking Abigail Disney, the granddaughter of Walt himself, came out against this bill. They literally had a Disney calling out Disney on this one. And thankfully, Chapek cracked under the pressure nearly immediately. Disney put out a formal statement denouncing the bill after it passed, halted all Florida campaign donations, and even reinstated a gay kiss in the 2022 Lightyear movie that had previously been removed. You hear that, Ron? We made Toy Story gay and it's all your fault! Yeehaw! Now, because no mealy mouth PR spin goes unpunished, Disney would end up catching flack from the other side, the Republicans, after changing their stance. Enemy of the channel Sean Foyt, for example, staged large protests outside of Disney World. Oh, I, I'm sorry, I mean Disneyland. Yeah, yeah, the one in California. Yes, the one 3,000 miles away from Florida. Yes, the one that has nothing to do with this whatsoever. Look, I didn't schedule the protest. Ask Sean. Anyway, though, Ron also took aim at the mouse himself, and with all of the governmental firepower he could muster, too. He specifically threatened to target things like Disney's zoning privileges, their tax breaks. He even threatened to install a law that would require Disney rides in particular to receive special inspections from the Florida Department of Agriculture. I don't know, does that mean they weren't inspecting these rides before? Who inspects rides in Florida. That's kind of an important job. Is there no one doing that? Do they not have someone to do that? All right, you know what? Well, for the time being, I'm just going to stick with my local Six Flags because now I'm really worried. But still, even with all the backlash, including a lawsuit from Disney that's still working its way through the courts, this still ended up being an overall victory for Ron in that it gave him a great deal of conservative clout. See, at the time, Ron was seen as something of a conservative hero for sticking to his principles and telling all those marginalized people that, hey, straight white guys have had enough of all their context and that nonsense. Kids need to be proud of America, and they certainly don't need to hear about how many slaves the Founding Fathers owned. Ron didn't just limit racism-driven legislation and policy to the classroom, either. June of 2019 had seen him sign an anti-sanctuary city bill, despite the fact that at the time, Florida had no sanctuary cities or plans to put any in place. And he followed that up by signing a law mandating that all Florida law enforcement cooperate with any ICE investigation or deportation effort. And then to round out this trifecta of terrible immigrant treatment, in September of 2022, Ron would steal a page out of Texas Governor Greg Abbott's playbook of exploitative stunts by sending a busload of around 50 immigrants from Florida to the liberal haven of Martha's Vineyard, Massachusetts. Except, like, this is somehow worse than it sounds, in that Florida used an undercover agent to recruit asylum-seeking Venezuelans in Texas under the guise of finding them a more permanent placement in the country. Ron then had them all flown into Florida, where they didn't even get off the plane before being sent to Martha's Vineyard in a clear and direct statement of mockery and rebellion against those immigration-affirming liberals of the New England region. Now, thankfully, these refugees did manage to sue Ron for this awful and atrocious display of what was essentially a politically motivated prank. Their lives and well-being were toyed with in such a display of ironic cruelty that I think the Joker would have told Ron to tone it down a little. And all those folks deserve significant compensation for the abuse that Ron put them through. That case is still ongoing, and I would highly encourage all of you to send those plaintiffs any spare good luck you might have sitting around. And tragically, even with all of Ron's active and performative destruction of the Floridian way of life, 
there were also still plenty of outside problems ready and waiting to cause the state trouble as well during his first term. One of these crises, I have to admit, he seems to have handled pretty well. In September of 2022, Hurricane Ian touched down in Florida as one of the deadliest hurricanes to hit the state in the last century. Ron, to his extremely begrudging credit, did ask for federal aid, consulted with the White House, and received bipartisan praise for his efforts in handling the cleanup. And then there was COVID. So as the deadly virus did first start appearing in the state in March of 2020, Ron initially did do the right thing and shut down the state. And he was able to maintain this reasonable safety conscious plan until all about June of that year, when he decided to start lifting stay at home orders in mass, shooting down mask mandates wherever he could find them, and literally banning local Florida municipalities from enacting or enforcing safety measures of their own. And as one might expect, these actions caused Florida's infection rate to skyrocket nearly immediately. Ron responded to this massive spike in cases by opening all Florida school districts for face-to-face -face instruction in October of 2020. And moving into 2021, the target of his rage would move to the newly produced vaccines for COVID. While DeSantis himself did get the vaccine, he staunchly opposed mandates of any kind and worked hard to cultivate the support of the anti-vax crowd. By April of 2021, Ron had rescinded every single COVID protection measure he had ever put in place and instead replaced all of those with new laws targeting any requirement for vaccines throughout the state. Laws were put in place as early as May of 2021 to prevent everyone from government offices to businesses, from schools to cruise ships for asking for proof of vaccination. For some reason, he saved a particular vitriol for masks to not only making mask mandates illegal throughout the state of Florida, but actively telling parents that he personally felt masking kids was a bad idea because apparently in America now, we're just out here taking medical advice from lawyers. He even publicly humiliated some students standing behind him at a speech for wearing masks. Yeah, how dare they try to protect other people from this deadly lung virus Ron just wants to wish out of existence. You do not have to wear those masks. I mean, please take them off. <laughs> Honestly, it's not doing anything, and we got to stop with this COVID theater. So if you want to wear it, fine, but this is, a, this is ridiculous. Okay, dick. But anyway, as things continued to get significantly worse for Florida throughout 2021, and the state finally started topping all of those COVID hospitalization charts, Ron went ahead and fully tripled down on this terrible approach of his. He would lash out at Biden for allowing the disease to spread through the U.S. southern border his state isn't attached to. He hired like-minded vaccine skeptic Dr. Joseph Ladapo as the state's new Surgeon General, and he even passed laws allowing hospitals to be fined for requiring vaccines. Hospitals. Hospitals! And then in 2022, he added what, in my opinion, was the cherry on the shit Sunday that was his first term by declining to order vaccines for children in Florida under the age of five, the only U.S. state to make that decision. <sighs> okay. Let's go ahead and recap that first term real quick, shall we? In just a tiny sample of the chaos and trouble he caused in his first term, Ron DeSantis spent much of his time trying to warp the Floridian educational system into a conservative-friendly husk of itself that censors slavery and idolizes colonizers. Got the state into a massive feud with Disney, one of its biggest local employers and enterprises, over his desire to also remove all things queer from Florida schools. He violated the rights of trans students by kicking them off their sports teams. He wasted time banning Floridian sanctuary cities that didn't exist. He literally sent immigrants to liberal towns in New England like some kind of half-assed YouTube prankster and made basically every wrong decision about COVID one could possibly make as the governor of a large state with a particularly vulnerable and elderly population. And so, as one probably expects by now, by the end of his first term, Juan was somehow more popular with Republicans than he ever had been before. For all the damage he had done to the state and every single one of its vulnerable populations, he played to every single Republican talking point he could possibly think of, and that did not go unnoticed from the voters he was trying to ingratiate himself with. I mean, we mentioned before that Ron was clearly looking to use this gubernatorial platform to boost his presidential profile, and by God, that was working for him. 
While the more reasonable half of the country saw him for the absolute demon that he was, Republican voters as early as 2021 were really starting to show an interest in the idea of a <laughs> President Ron DeSantis. This only accelerated into 2022 as well, as Ron continued to build his national profile and to cultivate his relationships with both big money GOP donors and conservative media. Both groups which seem to really take to the idea of Ron as a quote-unquote electable Trump. And then came Ron's 2022 gubernatorial re-election effort, where Ron was blessed with the easiest opponent I think anyone could possibly imagine in Charlie Crist. This highly unpopular former Republican governor of Florida turned Democratic wet blanket has, and I mean this respectfully, never accomplished anything of note in his whole life despite many, many chances to do so within various elected offices. He's not worth talking about, and I don't like him very much. But boy, oh boy, did Ron absolutely destroy this pathetic excuse for a gubernatorial candidate. He would claim an incredible 19-point victory for the Republicans and bolster their turnout across the entire state, even in the middle of an otherwise disappointing cycle for Republicans throughout the rest of the country. There was a moment in late 2022, at least, where Ron really could be seen as the only thing going right for the entire GOP. And here at the beginning of his second term in 2023, Ron seems only to have accelerated this apocalyptic shitpost-inspired version of governance he practices, and which at least at one point so immensely endeared him to the national GOP. This year alone, he removed Florida's concealed carry permit requirements, expanded the state's use of the death penalty, and sent the Florida National Guard to the Texas border to help out with the immigration crisis. Very stupid, very on-brand stuff, right? But now, he's arguably taking it even further than he ever has before by absolutely demolishing reproductive rights throughout his entire state. Almost immediately following the end of Roe v. Wade in the summer of 2022, Ron would sign a 15-week abortion ban for the state of Florida. And this year, he took that even further by signing an additional six-week abortion ban, more commonly known as a heartbeat bill. Now, both of these bills are currently making their way through the Florida Supreme Court. The 15-week ban is still in effect, while the six-week ban is being held off temporarily by the courts. But should the Florida Supreme Court rule in favor of that 15-week ban, then the six-week ban will go into effect immediately. And all I can say right now is any Florida friends out there with a uterus, stay safe and take care of yourself. But at this point, honestly, how could a guy like Ron even fail? He basically hit every single point he could on the GOP burn down your state checklist. He weaponized his Christian faith like a good conservative and made himself a hero to the American right wing by doing it all. I mean, obviously right now he's probably at the very top of the GOP's presidential primary polls, right? Well, about that. I mean, yeah, we can look at the chart and see he is okay. Yeah, he is technically in second place, so that's a good thing, right? And I mean, look, he's, I mean, yeah, okay, Trump, but like he's, Ron's the only other person who's got double digits. And he's still got this guy's support. I'm voting for Ron DeSantis for president. Alrighty then. <laughs> yeah, never mind. This is bad for Ron. So exactly how did this happen? Well, for starters, this guy happened. See, even after Trump's loss in 2020, things didn't immediately change for Ron. His sights had always been set on 2024, and following Trump's loss to Biden, even the Don's most ardent supporters all seemed to kind of agree that some sort of replacement or alternative was needed. But here's where it gets interesting. See, after that 2020 election loss, Trump was still widely popular with the GOP voter base. Plenty of people were more than ready to have him run against Biden in 2024. Initial loss be damned. And even the party members who were absolutely done with Trump had to be very tempered in any criticism of the man and absolutely had to stay on his good side. Now, Ron, he was kind of already in a good position at that point. He was the relatively successful Republican governor of a state with a very friendly legislature who 
basically gave him any bill that he wanted to sign. He had full control to essentially turn the entire state of Florida into a Republican laboratory, testing out every single GOP machination he could possibly think of, as we've seen he did here today. Furthermore, Ron maintained a strong relationship with Trump throughout most of his time as the Florida governor. They already had a close connection with Trump's preferred villainous lair at the Mar-a-Lago golf course being located in Florida. And in terms of ideology and legislative goals, the two have almost never disagreed with one another. But the problem was, Trump was never supposed to run in 2024. Republicans thought he was going to win in 2020 and take his second term. And Democrats thought he was going to lose in 2020 and they would never have to deal with him again. And so either way, the general assumption was kind of that 2020 was Trump's last election cycle. And the media seems to have kind of already been planning to push Ron as the GOP's frontrunner for this cycle. Since, well, he was kind of already expected to be the guy to replace Trump in 2024 anyway. His hardline, draconian approach to conservative governments in the state was obviously meant to build his following with Trump voters, and by God, he was successful in doing so for a time. Problem was, Trump didn't want an heir apparent. Trump wanted to run again. And it seems like, at least from an outsider's perspective, as Ron moved from sunshine state ally to potential presidential rival, Trump's opinion soured on him hard. The proof is in the sound bites. This was recorded in April of 2021. Mr. President, would you consider a running mate in Ron DeSantis? A lot of conversation about your relationship with Ron DeSantis. You're seeing him more in Florida. Would he be your pick for well, he's VP? He's a friend of mine. I endorsed Ron, and after I endorsed him, he took off like a rocket ship. He's done a great job as governor. A lot of people like that. You know, they, I'm just saying what I read and what you read. They love that ticket. Uh, but certainly Ron would be considered. He's a great guy. And this speech was recorded on November 5th of 2022, just days before Ron's gubernatorial election. But we have the best poll numbers. Where are they? Are they putting them up on the screen? I think so. Put them up. Look. Yeah, we're putting them up. We're winning. We're winning big, big, big in the Republican Party for the nomination like nobody's ever seen before. Let's see. There it is. Trump at 71. Ron DeSanctimonious at 10 percent. Mike Pence at seven. Oh, Mike's doing better than I thought. Dear God, I don't ever want to give Trump like credit for anything, but I got to admit, Ron DeSanctimonious is light years ahead of something like Lion Ted. Also, by the way, ha ha, Ron Lightyear, gay kiss. But Trump must have also sensed that he was in rare form at that moment because just a few days after dropping the sanctimonious line on all of us, he announced his next presidential campaign in November of 2022. He also did so right on the heels of a very disappointing election cycle for the mainstream GOP, now two years removed from his influence and looking just as bad as when he was there. And Ron was in a very interesting situation all on his own while all of this was taking place. He was still a state governor trying to act above all of the Trump nonsense while also trying to draw some of Trump's ever-mobilizing base of support towards himself. And so, as Ron's profile grew and Trump's friendship turned to hate, Ron just seemed to try to focus on Florida and ignore the noise. Problem is, though, there is basically nothing on this planet worse for an American politician than giving Donald Trump open time for mockery without retaliation. Ron tried to play it off, keep doing Florida work, and focus on the fact that he got re-elected while conveniently avoiding naming any people who didn't get re-elected. While in the same time frame, Trump was signal boosting the photo of Ron and those young women we saw from earlier, coming up with the admittedly less fun and slightly racist meatball Ron moniker, and then hitting the man with a diss so hard that it would probably have ended most people's careers. The problem with Ron DeSanctimonious is that he needs a personality transplant, and those are not yet available. Almost all congressmen and women that served with him and knew him well supported me, some of them surprisingly so, because of their relationship with Ron. I would say that when it comes to Lack of personality, Ron would be in a class with Asa Hutchinson, and that's not good. 
Oh, and that's not even to mention this. I found this late in my, like, editing and writing process, and I don't have a good way to shoehorn it in, but apparently at some point, like, back in 2019, Ron got caught on a plane by a reporter eating a pudding cup with his fingers, which, while hilarious on its own, was also made way more troublesome for Ron by this Trump ad. Ron DeSantis loves sticking his fingers where they don't belong. And we're not just talking about pudding. DeSantis has his dirty fingers all over senior entitlements. Like cutting Medicare, slashing Social Security, even raising our retirement age. Tell Ron DeSantis to keep his pudding fingers off our money. Oh, and somebody get this man a spoon. And so, how did Ron respond to all of this brutality, you might ask? Well, let's take a look at his Piers Morgan interview and see. One other governor's to do to do a great job. Which is your favorite nickname that Trump's given you so far? Is it Ron Ron de Sanctimonious or Meatball Ron? <laughs> well, I can't. Uh, like even he went off Meatball Ron. I, but. I can't. Uh, I don't know how to spell de Sanctimonious. I don't really know what it means, but I you know I kind of <laughs> like it's long. It's got a lot of vowels. I mean, so we we'll go with that. That's fine. You know, you can call me. You can call me whatever you want. And bear in mind, this interview took place in March of 2023. At the time. Ron hadn't even announced his campaign for president yet. But with Trump's massive Manhattan indictment in early April of 2023, it's been starting to look like he might not be available to run in 2024, if you know what I mean. Plus, you just, you can't let a guy hit you with nicknames and pudding cups like that without some sort of retaliation. Besides, 2024 was supposed to be Ron's year, right? Like, Donald lost. He lost in 2020. This is Ron's year. Yeah, Ron won his re-election campaign, Donald lost his, and Trump's probably going to jail soon anyway, right? Like, admittedly, if you ignore all those polls, Ron's campaign makes total sense. And so, in late May of 2023, Ron announced that he, too, would be running for president. Or at least, he, he tried to announce it. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, or good morning, everyone, depending on wherever in the world you're joining us from. I'm broadcasting live from David from Twitter headquarters. It's David Sachs here. Uh, Elon is sitting next to me. And we, want, and we want to welcome you to this historic Twitter Spaces event, and more broadly, a first in the history of social media. Uh, tonight, I'm pleased to introduce two individuals who've done more to loosen the... Well, let's see. So, yeah, Governor, uh, there's been a lot of speculation over the last couple of months about your your plans. Um, I understand that you may have an announcement to make. Uh, we've got, I think, a, a record audience assembled here. Uh, you know, the, probably the biggest uh, room that's probably ever been assembled online. Uh, what, what would you like to tell Not us? Not true. Well, I am running for president of the United States to lead our great American comeback. Look, we know our country's going in the wrong direction. We see it with our eyes, and we feel it in our bones. Our southern borders collapse. Drugs are pouring into the country. Our cities are being hollowed out by spiking crime. The federal government's making it harder for the average family to make ends meet and to attain and maintain a middle-class lifestyle. And our president, well, he lacks vigor, flounders in the face of our nation's challenges, and he takes his cues from the woke mob. And yeah, in case you were curious, that was the official announcement. I trimmed out a lot of dead air and just hot mic murmuring, um, but that is, generally speaking, what the good parts of that announcement sounded like. See, Ron tried to be slick about it and tap into the American right wing's ever-growing love of Elon Musk, announcing his candidacy on Twitter slash X's streaming platform called Spaces. But this notoriously glitch-to-hell platform was unable to keep up with the rather large demand of something like, oh, I don't know, the official announcement of a major presidential campaign. And since it seems like nobody bothered to have DJ Khaled give the okay to use all the most powerful servers in order to keep up with demand, the announcement was plagued with glitchy audio, long periods of stalling, and even longer periods of dead air. It was a good half hour into the event before Ron himself even showed up to very quickly make the announcement and then regurgitate a few talking points from his website before making a hasty exit. It was about as uninspiring as a presidential campaign announcement as one could possibly ask for. And in the end, I think that announcement really encapsulates the whole DeSantis campaign as a whole. 
<laughs> it was a big money, CEO-driven publicity stunt. That ended up playing out really poorly because of recycled political rhetoric and a lack of accessibility to the voting public. Which is just what Ron's campaign has been since about May. One area where Ron initially did very well was in campaign fundraising. He roared out of the starting gate with a massive $20 million donation-fueled war chest. An excellent start to a campaign and a declaration of serious intention for any major party contender. Now here's the thing, let's, you, the, you know who else had a really massive fundraising success right at the beginning of their presidential campaign before falling completely flat on their face and losing the primary in humiliating fashion? This guy. I think the next president needs to be a lot quieter but send a signal that we're prepared to act in the national security interests of this country to get back in the business of creating a more peaceful world. Please clap. And like old Jeb there, one of the reasons Ron has raised so much money is because he's really popular with the GOP's big money donors. See, the top of the GOP's hyper wealthy base of donors have viewed Ron as a way to wrestle control of the government away from the Democrats without involving Trump. And as such, they invested in Ron heavily because he's just a safe way to hinge their bets against Trump in this election, or at least the safest way they can hinge those bets. Here's the thing about big money donors. They give quick and they give in full. A full one third of all of Ron's donations so far have come from just those first 10 days after his announcement. And estimates say that he's raised as much as 40% of his total war chest from people giving the maximum donation amount of $3,300. And see, that may sound like a good thing, but in the modern age of political fundraising, the name of the game is small money donations from lots of people over a long period of time, like Trump or Bernie. Plus, about 3 million of that 20 million war chest for Ron came from people who donated the maximum amount and then donated more, which means that all that additional money is earmarked only to be used for the general election if Ron should win the primary, and if he doesn't, he has to pay all that money back. And Ron's fundraising is already starting to dry up. He's raising less money now than ever before. He completed three separate rounds of staff layoffs between just May and July of this year. And just this month, he was discovered to have spent around $1.5 million on private planes with campaign funds, all of which were booked within just a three month stretch. Okay, so yeah, the, the money thing's about to get real bad for him, but what about those recent debates? That's a chance for him to get up on stage and use that big voice of his to reassert those talking points that so appealed him to the American Republican voter the first time, right? Except there's a problem. He didn't say anything memorable in either of these debates. While reports generally say that Ron was the quote unquote winner, I watched both debates and I can tell you that I really don't have anything notable from Ron to put in this video. He won by playing it safe, sticking to his awful talking points we've all already heard, and it's doing nothing for his poll numbers. And then there's Ron just clumsily tripping over his own feet. And I mean that very literally, since it was indeed his feet which actually just recently called his big tough guy persona into question. Take a look at this clip from the Bill Maher show where Ron was on recently and tell me if you notice anything strange about his feet. Like specifically, where are his toes? cowboy boots with a suit. That's right. <laughs> so, I'm not going to fly. Okay, I, that's, uh, that's just a crazy... And this led to a brilliant investigation by Chris Thompson at Defector, who at least in my opinion has all but confirmed to us that Ron is wearing hidden wedges inside these cowboy boots of his in order to look taller. As a short king myself, I disapprove of all hype-based trickery. Embrace your shortness, Ron. And I guess this is as good a place as any in our story to bring things to a close and finally make our decision. So is Ron DeSantis the next great American presidential villain? Or is he just an urban myth? Well, in my opinion, I would say it's about 25% villain, 75% myth. Ron DeSantis reminds me just so much of last year's video subject, Ted Cruz. Both are Ivy League lawyers, effective electoral tacticians, and masters of using the law in pursuit of a greater goal to turn the U.S. into a conservative utopia. Both also have controversial public profiles that many people find especially annoying, demonstrate beliefs 
far to the political right of those held by the average American and make a habit out of courting only the worst voters by pursuing the worst policies for most Americans. And just like Ted Cruz, I think it's going to be Ron's personality that ends up leading to his downfall. Now, don't get me wrong, it's not a one-to-one -one comparison. Ron carries himself more with the blustering masculine swagger of a baseball dad who screams at a college-age barista for daring to ask if he wants soy milk. Whereas Ted, he's more of the debate team dad. He's not going to yell at the barista in public, he's just going to quietly talk to the manager over to the side and then stay to watch the firing. Two very different people, but both equally insufferable and equally unfit to have any role of leadership. That's what I'm saying. And see, with Ron, there's kind of a great tragedy in all of this, too. He was, at least at one time, a working-class kid who used his talents on the baseball diamond to pursue a better life for himself through an Ivy League education. He could have been that working-class hero he wants all of us to think that he is. And yet, if those secret societies at Yale tell us anything, it is only just how eager he was to sell out. And I mean, from there, he went on to teaching and creeping at a prestigious private school before going back to law school, then the Navy, then Guantanamo. And then he took all of that experience and proceeded to take it on a mission to rot the entire state of Florida from the inside out with as many conservative laws and policies as he could jam into existence. Little that Ron DeSantis has ever done in his life indicates even the slightest interest or concern in anyone more marginalized or less successful than himself. And that is probably, in my opinion, the single worst trait a politician could have. What he has done to the state of Florida is nothing short of a tragedy and a national embarrassment. And the good citizens of that lovely state don't deserve to be guinea pigs for this terrible conservative mad scientist. I know that if I have any viewers from Florida right now, you all don't need me to talk about how scary a Ron DeSantis presidency would be. He's been terrorizing your entire state and all of its citizens for years now. And every single one of you deserves better leadership and better policy than he has provided. My only solace in all of this is that I think Ron has hit his ceiling. He is too unlikable, too sniveling, and too bureaucratic to get the American public on his side for a full-scale presidential run. So to answer the question from earlier, I personally don't really think we need to be that worried right now about a President Ron DeSantis. And instead, we need to be more worried about a Governor Ron DeSantis and all of the damage he's doing to Florida. Just like I said about Texas last year, Florida is a beautiful, wonderful state that has been hijacked by leaders who never once had its best interests at heart. And all of us everywhere else across this country need to remember that even as Ron's presidential campaign falters, that doesn't do anything to help the people of Florida get out from under his influence. And honestly, I don't even think he's done causing harm through politics either, sadly. My guess is that he's got a long career as a senator waiting after this whole presidential thing falls apart. So even if he doesn't get us with the big blockbuster summer slasher, he very well could punish us all with the straight-to-DVD sequel. And likewise, there's still that 25% fear I mentioned earlier, which namely is the very real possibility that Donald Trump could be fully removed from this next election cycle, which admittedly would be a good thing on its own, but would also potentially leave us with a much more viable Ron DeSantis candidacy. Right now, at least, Trump is the clear and really the only choice that the GOP has to put forth as their presidential candidate for the next election. His polling is so far ahead of everyone at this point that they would look foolish running anybody else. And yet Donald Trump is still under criminal indictment and at very real risk of further legal issues up to and including imprisonment if we're all lucky. Should Trump end up in any capacity fully unavailable for a 2024 run, well, then things might change dramatically for Ron and we'll be back here talking about him once again. Until then, I don't think we need to worry, but stranger things have happened. And in the end, the outcome is the same. We all just collectively need to be mocking and criticizing Ron DeSantis anywhere and everywhere that we can. And thankfully, he's so unlikable and terrible that it just never gets old. Oh, it's so good to make fun of him. And in fact, maybe just maybe, we could replace baseball as the American pastime with making fun of Ron DeSantis. Good night, everyone. 
Whew. All right. Another one in the books. This is my Halloween special. Thanks for sticking to the end. Uh, I'm going to wrap this up quick uh, because it is late. I filmed it late, so it would be a little spooky dark. Um, thank you all so much, as always. I didn't go quite as crazy this year. We pumped all of our energy into Jen's J-Rod special. If you haven't had a chance, go take a look at that. Um, in the meantime, we love all of y'all so much. Thank you, as always, for supporting us. Um, we're getting close to the end of the year. It's been almost another full year of Fundy Fridays, man. I'm getting existential but also emotional um so thank you all for being there if you really like what we do here on the channel i will let you know we have a patreon uh i'd highly encourage you to check it out we also have youtube memberships those two things really are the the backbone of what we do here jen and i both do this full time and it's because of all these wonderful patrons and and members who have allowed us to do that um so if you really like what we do and how we approach things here at fundy fridays i would highly encourage you to look into those they they help us out more than we could ever tell you and plus they get you access to our awesome discord server our weekly watch parties our live streams some special episodes and bonus content so that's always awesome um definitely encourage you to check those out we also have a merchandise store through bonfire um i would also encourage you to check that out as well including the all new vampire ho t-shirt by our partnered artist friend lauren marvell we got a couple others too i'm not gonna list them all you can go check them out for yourself but that's uh Fundy Friday's Bonfire Store. You can honestly just Google Fundy Friday's merch and you'll see it. It's right there at the top. Um, but if it ain't official Bonfire, it ain't official Fundy Friday's. We only right now do our merch through Bonfire. So if you see it anywhere else, it's bootleg. But in the meantime, other than that, um, thank you all so much for just watching as always. If you're watching the outro by now, um, you probably, you've watched all the way to the end. And I know a lot of people don't do that. Most people don't do that. Thank you for making it way all the way to the end with me. Um... Thank you for enjoying another Halloween with us. And thank you for taking this deep dive down the rabbit hole with Ron DeSantis with me. Um, I hope I've answered some questions. I hope you, I've made you feel a little bit better. And if uh, I did my job right, I encouraged you to make fun of him even more than you hopefully already were. So uh, thank you all so much. You take care. Do something kick-ass this weekend. I don't know what you're going to do. Do something this weekend that's super kick-ass, though. And um, love yourself. Take care of yourself. Drink some water. Drink some sleep. Eat some water. <laughs> um, drink some water. Get some sleep. Eat some food. Take care of yourself. You're too, you're too great. You're too great to let waste away. I don't know why I'm saying that. I'm just having a good time. Thank you all so much. Take care. Have a good night. But I always thought Ron was a little bit heavy. And then one day I'm with him and I pat him on the shoulder and I go, whoa, that's strong. That's a lot of muscle there. My hand didn't sink in like it does with a lot of people. And then I see him without a shirt one day. And this guy is strong. And he's not fat. That's all power. That's all muscle. I want to tell you that. And I said, Ron, you're one of the few I say it to. Don't walk around with a jacket all the time. Take it off. People are going to see the real Ron. <laughs>